Well, hello, inmates. It is May 1st uh, already, and uh, we're, what, six weeks into solitary confinement, sequestering. Uh, <laughs> it's been an interesting month of April, so we can put that behind us and start May. Unbelievable. It feels like uh, that March was four months ago. So it's absolutely crazy to see how <laughs> time seems to be moving slowly. And yet, at the same time, quickly. I don't really understand the feeling. Like, what was it, five weeks ago that Mayor Pete dropped out of the race? I mean, that literally feels like seven months ago. So, anyway. All right, welcome aboard. Uh, nice to have you guys here for edition six or seven or eight or nine. I don't even know how many we've done so far, uh, but we've been meeting Fridays at noon, talk about hypnosis, talk about um, the mind, talk about the, the career, talk about my hair that's getting long and needs to be cut. Uh, talk about anything. Uh, I know there's not much happening for shows. Uh, I haven't done a show in six weeks, so I don't have a whole lot of content, new content to put up, but we've been, we put some uh, new video up yesterday. Uh, Brent edited that from some of the old shows. We got lots of tons of old footage, but uh, nothing really new and fresh. So anyway, let me bring you up to speed. Uh, last week was a very interesting week for me. On uh, Saturday morning, I woke up with real bad pain in my back. And I thought, yeah, God, it feels like old, right? I'm old, 45. And so, but then the pain started getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And I had a hard time moving and the muscle was seizing up. And it was like, I mean, it was bad. And, uh, and I, I'm a pretty good judge of pain. I've been in car crashes. I've, I've broken tons of bone playing sports. And I mean, I've had my fair share. So this was like different kind of pain. So I'm like, oh my God, what happened? You know, what's going on? So I decide, which was a difficult decision to make, to go into the ER, you know, especially with COVID-19 going around, the last place I want to go is to go to a place that I could potentially get exposed. So I go to the hospital and they order a CT scan and they put me through the little, zzz, zzz, right? And get a CT scan. And turns out I have a kidney stone. Son of a bitch! So I, uh, I'm at the hospital and waiting the results and then you have a kidney stone and uh, you're gonna have to just pass it. God damn it. Those of you who've had a kidney stone before and have passed a kidney stone, I commend you. I feel sorry for you. Um, I mean, given the choice between passing a kidney stone and, you know, bungee jumping without a bungee, you know, take the jump. I mean, it was brutal. But I tapped into some help hypnosis, some self hypnosis, and it was really testing uh, one, my capacity, two, my skill set, uh, three, my desire to live, my will to keep going. Holy shit, it, it is, it's incredible. Those of you maybe not familiar with kidney stones, uh, there's kind of a couple of, you know, couple stage process, right? You got your kidney, and then from the kidney is the ureter that goes to the bladder, and then from the bladder is your urethra, that's the tube that goes out of your wiener and uh, pee in the toilet, right? So two kind of stages. So the kidney stone comes out of the kidney and goes through the ureter, but then at the edge of the bladder, there's a kind of a little valve there and it got stuck right at the edge of the bladder, which is a very common place for it to get stuck. So now the issue is all the fluid backs up in the kidney. So the kidney swells. So on the CT scan, there's my regular kidney and then there's my super kidney. And that is so painful. And the, the, the fluid's not getting through because there's a plug. Now there's a plug there and it's not getting through. So... It's crazy, right? It's a horrible situation. 
And there's certain positions where obviously some fluids kind of getting by the stone, right? Getting by and going into the bladder and then, you know, after that you can pee and it's not a big deal. But so fluids getting through, but only in certain situations. One of the situations is if I would go in the hot tub, I don't know if my inner organs would kind of swell a little bit, but I could feel my kidney sort of drain and the fluid goes into the bladder. So hot tub was a relief. Um, so that was nice. The second was if I leaned, uh, put a little bit of pressure on my stomach with a pillow and leaned over the edge of the sofa and put my right knee up onto the sofa like a dog peeing. That angle would slowly let the kidney uh, drain and get past the stone into the bladder. But now I gotta pass this freaking thing. I gotta get it through that little valve into the bladder. So I'm doing some hypnosis. I'm trying to relax my ureter, which I, I don't even, like, <laughs> I don't know, right? So I'm like, relax the ureter and doing this meditation monk shit, you know? And I'm like trying to think of anything and Kate's hypnotizing me. And I mean, it is, it is awful, right? It's an awful experience, but I'm like, okay, I can do this. I can be one with my ureter. <laughs> and anyway, so I did a little bit more research and find that there's a, correlation between people who ride roller coasters, they get off the roller coaster and they pass a kidney stone because of the movement and shaking of the roller coaster. So I'm like, hmm, well, I don't have a roller coaster, but the kids have a trampoline in the backyard. So when my kidney was swollen, I go jump on the trampoline a little bit, which was extremely painful with a swollen kidney, but within five, six, seven, eight minutes, it would drain through because it was moving it around. It wasn't getting through, it was, I wasn't you know, being able to get it through, but it, the tr jumping on the trampoline with a kidney stone is painful, but it works. So here I am, hot tub trampoline, hot tub trampoline, right? Ridiculous. And so to make a long story even longer, I do some more research and find Dr. Schultz, who has a botanical pharmacy in Marina del Rey, California, and he's got some programs. We had some of his stuff, you know, from before, um, different supplements and things like that, like superfood and all kinds of cool things. Well, he has an emergency kidney stone flush drink. I'm like, okay, all right, let's see what this can do. Emergency kidney flush. And it's like, go get Granny Smith apples or the sourest apples you can get. So check, go to the store and buy like a bucket of big, huge, like three bags of like Granny Smith apples. Buy lemons buy limes, apple cider vinegar, olive oil. All right, okay, okay. Put it all in, put it through the juicer. I mean, this stuff you can't even barely drink. It is so like tart and so acidic. So now I make, I gotta make 80 ounces of this stuff. And I'm like every hour pounding, you know, a glass of this. And it's brutal. I mean, I feel like it's tearing my stomach insides, my lining of my stomach up. But sure enough, it starts to dilute and break apart the stone. And I literally felt it happen. I feel pressure in my kidney, pressure in my kidney. This is a Monday morning, pressure in the kidney. And then I feel this little sharp pain. I'm, oh. And then the kidney just drains. And I'm like, I think the stone went through the valve, through that little valve into the, into the bladder. Now I'm like, I gotta pee this thing out. I mean, I, now I'm, I'm, I'm imagining in my mind like a golf ball going through a garden hose. Like, it's just not going to work. I'm just, okay, maybe a marble through a straw. How are we getting here? But it's not going to work, right? This is not going to happen. I'm dreading this. It's not going to be great. So wait, now, I, now the next time I go pee, I'm expecting now the stones in the bladder. I got to go through the urethra. Um, I think I've lost a lot of followers by now. So... <laughs> I go to the bathroom, like I think I can go, and I, they give me the little filter. You gotta pee in the little filter because they wanna collect the stones because they're weirdos or they wanna test it or whatever. So I start doing the peeing and chunks come out, little tiny, tiny pieces. It broke, the stone actually broke into five or six pieces because of that acidic drink. It kind of came out in like shale slices. It was, and it was super easy to urinate out. There was no problems at all. Like pain level was zero. So there you go. Hot tub, trampoline, kidney flush drink that's really acidic and sour, 
And I mean, there was 10 ounces of apple cider vinegar in that. And then I was doing shots of olive oil and lemon juice because the olive oil acts as like a lube. Anyway, I'm alive. I feel much better. I feel great. Okay, so that's what's happened to me in the last week. All right, welcome aboard. Let's get to some questions. Um, okay. Uh, William Lux, thanks. I am feeling better. Uh, love Fridays at News. Thanks, Jared. Okay. Uh, Rita, how you feeling? Did you do hypnosis through the medical emergency? Oh, yeah, I'm getting caught up. I, obviously, I shared some of this. Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, evening here in South Africa. Hello. Welcome back, South Africa. Um, oh, Brett put the link to the video. Uh, last week, I think some, we missed a lot of questions and comments because it's hard to keep up to all these. And somebody's like, you know, Brent, you're just yelling to Brent to uh, put these videos up so much for social distancing. Hey, Brent's not even in Las Vegas. He's in Calgary, Alberta. And we have this thing called technology. He's watching, I'm talking, he's listening, he's typing, he's awesome, and it can be done thousands of miles away. Pull your head out of here. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, I have a list of things to bring down to you, Vegas. Do you ever have bridge mixtures or turtles? Uh, turtles are awesome. I, we think we can get turtles here. Um, turtle chocolates. I think we can get them here. Um, so uh, I've seen the show. It's awesome. Thank you so much. Pick a participant's hip uh, when you, they can be hypnotized. What's the first thing I look for? First thing I look for is actually the opposite of choosing a good volunteer. Uh, when they first come up on stage, the first thing I do is I look and I go, who's going to be my troublemaker? Who's the loud, obnoxious, drunk ass that could cause me problems through the induction, through the hypnotizing process that could be disruptive, could cause issue to people getting hypnotized. And I start to identify who those people are uh, first. So it's almost like a reverse selection process. And then I'm not really worried about who my stars are going to be until about three or four tests in, until I've done the induction to see where the hand of the bucket and the balloon goes. I see how they respond to hand clasps. I see how they respond to the uh, hot and cold routine, how they respond to the orchestra. So I am really start paying attention to the last three or four of that series of five. So I'm not really looking for anything when they first come up on stage. Um, Brian's asking, would I rather eat Big Turks and Animal Bars or Popcorn Twists for the rest of my life? Um... Probably Nanaimo bars are my favorite of the three, um, but you don't know, that's just asking for another kidney stone. Uh, all right, um, what group, uh, what age group do you have in your show in the participants? Uh, okay, well, because of the content of the show, obviously it's, uh, we do 18 and older uh, for the Vegas show, but when I do fairs and festivals and things like that, I, you know, we'll bring up anybody who's kind of interested in, in participating in the show. So I've had as young as, eight years old on stage, if it's a family appropriate fair outside festival type show or a family reunion or something like that, it doesn't really matter. Although I teach a large section on why mixing kids and adults isn't great. Um, just like they say in the movies, you know, uh, kids and animals <laughs> don't work with kids and animals. Uh, they're unpredictable and they steal the show. Uh, so that sometimes can be a little bit uh, problematic. So, all right. Uh, Rob Adair is watching. Hey, Rob. Um, Rob Adair, I used to live, uh, I used to live next to Rob growing up in, uh, in Peace River until about second grade. And he's been posting some really awesome photos about, um, you know, some things, photos, 10 photos over 10 days or whatever on Facebook. And even though I didn't comment, I'm commenting now, I really appreciated seeing that. And it was nice seeing a photo of you and your dad and how much you look like your dad now. And it just brought back some nice memories. And it was nice to see some, some photos of of all the family. So nice to have you on board. All right. Uh, hello from Dubai. Hello, Dubai. Uh, Jamie Gerard, you hypnotized me many times. I remember, of course I remember. Um, you were actually hypnotized in one of my earlier shows, probably one of my very first year or two that I was doing shows. Um, I was much, when, I, when we were much younger, you laid me on a bed of nails and then stood on me. Oh yeah, I remember nailing you. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, you also put me between two chairs and made me stiff as a board and stood on me. Uh, yes. Uh, wondering why I don't do this in your shows anymore. Well, there's actually a big, there's, it's not that risky to the participant if it's done right. And if you lay a girl in between, you know, it's called body catalepsy is actually what it's called. And you lay somebody between two sawhorses and stand on them. And, and it's, it's actually a bigger risk to the hypnotist, um, bigger risk, you know, for people just, you know, it is, if you are successful or you have a show or whatever, it's just an opportunity and invite for somebody to want to sue you or something. So it just, it was never worth the risk to me. That's what I decided about a 
10 years ago or so that it was no longer worth the risk. Um, I've stood on probably, I don't know, 1,500 people in my career and never had any issues. So, um, because if you do it right, you know, it's actually possible. It's possible to do body catalepsy um, without being hypnotized, but it requires a lot of focus and it's really easy to break your focus. And if you break your focus, you know, then you, you collapse. And so that's why hypnosis is such a super conscious state where you become focused on the task at hand. And that's what makes it that much more effective. And of course, way easier to do. All right, uh, Sh Sharif, uh, hypnotized by me in 2010. Uh, awesome, welcome back. Uh, okay, um, okay, let's see, I'm trying to catch up to some of these. Uh, you hypnotize someone on stage when the audience that left the theater that you're called back, uh, called back to that person to be unhypnotized. Um, I don't really recall anything off the top of my head, only because it's impossible to really stay hypnotized. Once they go through a sleep cycle, everyone kind of gets back to normal and there's no real danger um, because you can't, just like you can't stay awake for a long period of time for three, four, five days in a row, you can't stay sleeping for more than, you know, a day or two in a row. Like it's so, you can't stay hypnotized. The mind goes through these natural, natural cycles. It's a cyclical process. So again, you can't really stay hypnotized. So it's not an issue. More people that are with them panic more than the person who's hypnotized. They're like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm so relax. Yeah, they're fine, they're fine, you know, so. All right, um, okay, um, let's see here, a couple more. Uh, you're gonna have to repeat the ingredients to that kidney stone drink. Uh, you know what, I'm, uh, I'll try to find the link for it, but just look up Dr. Schultz, uh, S-C-H, U-L-Z-E, Z-E for the Canadians, um, Dr. Schultz emergency kidney flush or something like that. And you'll see it, it'll have like Granny Smith apples, you know, lemons, limes, and he'll, it'll be pretty easy to find. All right, um, okay, let's see. Okay, you guys are, Rob wrote some comments about the kidney stone, thanks. Cole, um, considering purchasing the online training course. Cool. All right. Well, let me see. Well, how do you suggest is the best way to practice with the only one person in the house with me? Well, why do you have to practice with only the one person in the house with you? I mean, my partner, Kate, is a hypnotherapist and does, prior to COVID-19, does every single session online. Every single session online. All of her client therapy sessions are all done over Skype or FaceTime or Zoom. So, you don't actually need the one person that's in the house with you. Uh, you can work with anybody, any family members, anybody you connected with, coworkers, friends. So that doesn't, it isn't required. Um, so absolutely keep that in mind. And now with COVID-19, hypnosis is going to change slightly. Well, for at least for a little bit, you know, we're going to minimize contact. Uh, you know, so a lot of the contact things that I'll be teaching, I'm still going to teach all the techniques because when this coronavirus thing's over, you can still implement these techniques. But ultimately, you can hypnotize somebody just like this over, you know, over media, some type of uh, video conferencing. So yeah, that's not required. So don't worry about that. Um, those of you who are signed up for the course, uh, it really is a fun course. If you're, if you're really considering doing it, Cole, you should. Um, I promise you're going to love it. It is, it, we're having a great time. And you can catch up easily, that's not a problem. And uh, because all the Zoom meetings and things that we do are all recorded and posted in the modules so that you can kind of watch and hear other people's questions and, and whatnot. Jason Parker, hey, what's up, brother? We, uh, we grew up together. We, um, we lived uh, eight, ten doors down from each other and uh, lost touch for over the years when I moved to Grimshaw out of town and from second grade on, but we kept in contact a little bit and then uh, have been more in contact in the last 10 years than we were than the previous decade. So nice to see you on board. And uh, yeah, of course, I'd love to hypnotize you. Uh, I've been, I've been uh, thinking about that. Uh, yeah, I think you'd, your personality would be really a lot of fun on stage. So anyway, um, son's 33 years old and stutters. All right, Jack, I got your question here. Uh, my son is 33 years old and stutters. Not sure how to help him with this issue. He's a medic and it does come into play during stressful emergency. So any thoughts are appreciated. All right. Stuttering is a challenging thing to overcome in a conscious state because something it's difficult to change something in one level of consciousness when it was created by another level of consciousness. 
and stuttering and stammering is really subconscious driven. It's tied into an association of anxiety or linked to whatever caused it in the first place, or at least a combination of things that have caused that. So to consciously think your way out of it is virtually impossible, if not impossible. Uh, so hypnosis is such an effective tool for that um, because here's the mind works like a matrix, okay? Like a math matrix. If you t think a math matrix, like those Sudoku puzzles, right, where the numbers are all connected to each other, you change one value of number, everything else down the puzzle and down the matrix changes. Hypnosis works the same way. You have fear of public speaking, and it's connected to your palms getting all sweaty and your stomach turning in knots, but that's all connected to the fear of criticism. But if you change the fear of criticism, everything else down the chain changes and the public speaking gets much better, if that sort of makes sense. So stuttering is very, very similar in how it's approached. So reach out to us, uh, reach out to us through my website um, and uh, Kate's taking clients. Um, I haven't been at the moment because I'm so deep into this course that I'm, the video course that I'm working on. Um, and maybe that'll change sometime in, in the future, but at the moment, uh, we can absolutely uh, help you uh, with that. So, uh, all right, Brent put the link to the five-day kidney detox. Thanks, that's for the five-day program, but I think there's a different link, uh, Brent, if you can find for the uh, the kidney flush um, drink. So, I'm yeah, if, if you can't find it, I'll find it. Uh, Tiger King, Mark Savard? No, I'm not the Tiger King, I believe uh, his name is. I don't remember his name. What's his name? What's Tiger King's name? Sorry. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. Um, anyway, um, no, but I have watched it. Um, I liked it. I thought it was okay. I felt like I was dumber by the end of it. Uh, but that bitch, Carol Baskin, though. Anyway. Um, okay. Paul's asking, have I ever worked with Anthony Gailey? No, I have not. Uh, we met only a few months ago, and when he was in town a couple of months ago, uh, we went out for lunch. That was the very first time we met in person, the other time we met on, on the phone. So I don't know Anthony Gailey well at all. We both know of each other and have for a while, but have never met in person up till just a few months ago. Uh, Rich, how did you get started working with Dr. John Zuli? Uh, John Zuli is a mentor of mine, and he was the lead or co-instructor at Gilboyne School. Gilboyne was shifting into maybe retirement or maybe not instructing as much, and he was instructing sort of the higher levels. And Gil taught many of the courses there, uh, sorry, John taught many of the courses at Gil School. And John comes from both sides, Gil's training and trained with John Kappas at Hypnosis Motivation Institute. Before it was Hypnosis Motivation Institute, I believe, I'm not sure. And so John and I um, met, I mean, I was 22 years old, I think when I took the 20, maybe maybe even younger, uh, 21 years, 20, doesn't matter. I was really young, taking the course uh, in Los Angeles, and John and I just hit it off. We, you know, we like sports, we liked outdoors things, we liked water skiing and boating and, and hypnosis, and we really hit it off. And we kept in touch over the years, and um, then we worked together. He moved to Vegas and we opened a hypnotherapy school together uh, for a while. We ran that for a while. And then he ended up going back to California. Um, so we dissolved the school and moved it to just uh, trainings that were happening, uh, live trainings. And we were only doing that every couple of three years. Uh, and, and then John and I um, you know, kept developing our relationship over the years. I've known John, I don't know, 20, 25 years. And uh, yeah, so that's how we got started working together because he worked at Gil Boyne School. Um, he is a wealth of knowledge of hypnosis and I uh, still occasionally tap to him or tap into him for uh, knowledge on therapy. He's a wonderful therapist, uh, one of the best I've ever seen. Okay. Um, have you ever had a, my, a major injured volunteer by doing physical movements like in the Lord of the Dance bit? Um, I think maybe a guy's knee got sore one time. There was a, a, a guy that I did a show um, with oh, years ago that the suggestion was you stay in front of the stage, stay in front of the curtain and doing some stuff and don't go behind the curtain was what, for some reason didn't hear that suggestion and went in behind the curtain and actually tripped on an amplifier and ended up cracking his ankle or something. So um, that was way back in Canada years ago. But to be honest, we've actually really had 
you know, great luck. I've got some great assistants. Um, it's not just luck, of course. Great assistants that take care of the volunteers and stagehands um, that are involved, and we do the best that we can. Because, uh, but shit happens, you know. Oh, like we've had people get hit. You know, people are dancing, and an arm moves around, and someone takes an arm in the face, and the nose is bleeding. Well, that's just stuff that that happens. You know, you put twelve people on stage doing anything, not hypnotized, and you do it repeatedly three hundred times a year. You know, elbows get into faces, and it, bumps happen. Um, but for the most part, anybody who's hypnotized, you know you can see that it's not based on negligence. It's just, you know, we have fun and we do the things and, and you know, it's happened where someone's like, yeah, I got knocked in the mouth and my fat lip, but it was my own fault. I went around the thing and I danced and our guy was swinging his arm. And that's kind of all the extent of what really normally happens that I can remember. All right, hello from Malaysia. What's up, Malaysia? Uh, Jeff went to my wife's page, which seemed like mainly sexual-based hypnosis for many different issues. Is that her only avenue, or does she also help other, with other things like uh, generation, general fears and phobias? Great question, Jeff. Uh, she specializes in sexual trauma for people, people who, you know, people who are raped, and they have sexual emotional trauma, and then it affects how their life is, uh, how their sex life is from then on onwards with their partners or whatever, because those are severe initial sensitizing events. Even if a person has a, a great sex life with their husband for 10 years and then something happens and then they get abused or raped by some stranger and they go back into their same relationship that was perfect, there's some emotional and psychological problems there because of these types of events that happen. So she deals primarily with that kind of thing, also with sexual performance, sexual anxiety, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's her level of expertise. She's also really promotes a sex positive environment for people, whatever, you know, fantasies and things that they're interested in. It's all good. Her favorite saying is never yuck anyone's yum. And we have such a, a, a reserved uptight view on, on sex and sexual perversions that people just need to let that shit go and enjoy your life. And so she's really big on that. So that's important. However, she does a lot of client, uh, does a lot of client uh, work with like uh, um, anxiety, uh, public speaking, um, any type of uh, test performance, uh, students, um, deals with weight loss, deals with self-image, uh, self-confidence, um, any types of depression, all of the things that are related about how the mind communicates to the human body. Uh, because in order to get the most out of yourself, you got to get the most out of your life. Uh, you get the most out of your life by getting the most out of your mind and body. So that's what she does. She also does relationship coaching and also uh, how to communicate with your partner um, and so on and so forth. So does all kinds of things that she's a hypnosis, mind-based expert. Not And you don't have to necessarily be, like I don't have to be a professional golfer to be able to help a golfer because I'm not helping change the stroke the, the how they hit the ball, the I don't know, stance, the way they keep their left arm, you know, I'm, I don't need to know any of that stuff. I'm a mind expert and I'm going to help coach and teach the mind expert. Same thing that she does. She specializes in, again, sex therapy and sexual uh, trauma, healing sexual trauma. But when it deals with the mind, she's an expert on the mind. So everything falls under that window. So there you go. If you're considering doing a session with her, reach out to her. She rocks. She's so good. She's better at therapy than I am. All right. Uh, see, I'm a little too mean. I'm too confrontational in therapy. I'm make you cry. All right. I've seen some of the videos where some of the volunteers pick up on each other's volunteer suggestions. Do you know why they pick up on someone else's suggestion? Yes, they are in a suggestive state. Samantha, they're in a suggestive state. So they can pick up. It's happened where I like give a person I'm touching right now. You're going to do this, this, and this. And then the person next to them starts doing the suggestion because I didn't pay attention that when I was leaning in to touch the person on the shoulder, my knee or my foot was touching their foot. So with their eyes closed, they could feel, oh, I'm the person he's touching. So <laughs> errors can happen like that. Um, you know, that's, it just depends on, on the situation, how they take the suggestion. I try to be very specific about how I'm adjusting the suggestion. Person I'm touching right now and I'll touch multiple times or I'll do a tap. But also when they're doing things as a group, 
they're naturally suggestible. So, and social conformity plays a role here, or a role. So they'll also start doing what other people are doing. It, it's very, I mean, just think of human behavior. We're just following that basic simple rule of human behavior. It happens all the time. All right. Have you ever done a handshake instant induction? I believe on you, Eric Walden, I might have. <laughs> uh, but I think handshakes are going to start really decreasing in popularity here. So uh, I don't know how many more uh, of those, you know, I'm going to have to develop a, uh, a Skype instant induction somehow. You know, take your computer and move it real fast. And I don't know. Okay. Uh, Amazing instant hypnosis. Uh, there, Brent's responding to Eric. Uh, Brent's quick on all the links. I don't know where you, how you pull up these videos so quick. Um, okay. Okay, and these, there's so many great questions. You guys are awesome. Um, okay, I'm trying to get to as many as I can. Uh, Tim, the guy that did the boy band Dirty Pop Dance, he must have practiced that for some other reason. Do you recall the background, the wedding talent show? Uh, he must have done it a lot. I agree. Okay, so sometimes you know, that their perception of what is being asked of them is uh, altered and skewed a little bit because of what they're bringing to the table. So yeah, we started doing the boy band routine with the voodoo doll, and then he just took over. You know, it was like the suggestion was, he took the suggestion as I'm doing that, that you've turned into a boy band without me actually saying it. And he just became a boy band. And some of those are the funniest moments of the show because I just look at him and go, what the hell's happening, right? I mean, of course I know what's happening, but you just kind of look and shrug to the audience and go, I don't know. And that makes it entertaining in itself. But yeah, that was really funny. Uh, Joanne Noseworthy, uh, love the pinball machines. Oh, reminds me of my teenage years at the games arcade. Uh, how many do you have and what are they? Great question. Uh, I have this one at the very, very end right here is World Cup Soccer. And it's one of the very first pinball machines that got me hooked on pinball. Uh, my friend of mine had one and uh, we'd go to his place. Um, this was in, you know, it wasn't in, in like mid 20s, late 20s. And I became a huge fan of pinball then. And then I started becoming snooty about pinballs. And I'm like, okay, what's the best pinball out there? Who makes the best? What's the best rated? Uh, so depending on when you check the ratings, because they're always changing, because people vote on them on these pinball forums, got a bunch of pinball nerds. Uh, anyway, um, this is number one machine of all time. It's called Medieval Madness. And um, it's a very, very fun machine to play. It's got castles and all kinds of stuff. And it's really cool. And then the second best machine all time is Attack from Mars. And that's a really great machine, a lot of fun to play. And then this machine is called Monster Bash, which is I think rated number three all time. And it is a fantastic, fantastic machine with all the monsters, Dracula and Frankenstein and all that kind of stuff. And it's a really, really good pinball machine. Um, and those of you, I, I used to have um, some slot machines here, really awesome slot machines and I just got rid of them. I sold them all and I'm using the money for something else. And it's a surprise. I'm not telling you what it is. It's so wickedly awesome. It's very, very cool. Um, so you'll see, but it's, I'm getting it custom built. So it's gonna be a little while before I do that. Um, I showed, flashed this in the, uh, in the shot. Let me tell you a little bit about this. This particular painting Okay, I'm really good buddies with Michael Goddard. Michael Goddard is the guy who paints the olives and the wine glasses, and he's a, a wonderful painter. And we were flying to uh, Salt Lake City, and we, we went to um, the Motley Crue concert. This was, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago. And Motley Crue, he's buddies with Vince Neil and the guys, and, and he's like, hey, um, do you want to come to the Motley Crue concert? We're going to go and hang with the band and afterwards and do some stuff. And I'm like, great, that sounds awesome. So we're on the flight, going to the Motley Crue concert, and you know, I'm thinking this is pretty cool. And I start telling them, hey, I'm doing a little kind of mini games room that I have a whole lot of space. I want kind of something the vegas -y. Um, And I'll tell you what I ended up with. And I, so I was thinking I want someone to paint like a Vegas sign, a mural, right? Like a Vegas sign. And he said, I advise you, I have some, of course, I'm not going to ask you to do it, Michael, because you're like a, you know, your paintings are worth tons of money. 
and he goes, he goes, I wouldn't paint it for you anyways, because you don't want it on the wall, because if you move or you do any kind of renovations, you always feel bad to paint over it. He goes, paint it on a canvas, get it done on a canvas. And I said, well, okay, well, will you do it for me? Or, you know, he volunteered. He goes, why don't I just paint it for you? And I'm like, well, how much? He goes, just pay me for my time and my materials. You just want a Vegas sign? I go, yeah. I go, uh, so I took a couple of photos and I said, I kind of want something a little zoomed up and, and, you know, close up. And he goes, great. So how much are you charge me? And he goes, you're my friend. I can't really charge you anything. I'm like, I'm going to pay materials. So, and, and he goes, no, no, that's really all I want. I'm not going to charge you for the painting. Just the materials and a little bit of my time. So 250 bucks. I'm like, deal. I actually gave him the 250 on the plane. I'm like, gave it to him. And I'm like, deal, 250 bucks. So about a week later, okay, well, we go to the concert and it's a great concert. It was a lot of fun, great seats. And then we go backstage after and we hang out with Vince Neil and the band and this is great. Nikki Six, he's really, really focused when he's doing his thing. And the guys were, they were really nice. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and we were very well received. So then a week later, he calls me and he goes, okay, I have a problem. And I go, okay, what's the problem? He goes, I finished your painting. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, I made it nice and big. And it's an issue because it turned out really fucking good. And I'm like, okay, cool. And he goes, I I'm not going to, it's your painting. You decide what you want to do with it. He goes, I'll give it to you as is. And it will be worth about a thousand bucks. But if you let me paint my olive on it, and then we'll do a digital photo of it and reproduce it. And then I can sell it in my gallery and the painting will now be worth like a lot. I'm going to tell you what it's worth. Um, yeah, I got, I got a gates and a house alarm. You're not going to come steal it. It's like worth $100,000. And I'm like, okay, yeah, totally sell the painting and do what you want with it. I'm like, I'm it's totally cool with me. And, he, and I said, I'll just get a print of it. He goes, no, no, no. It's your painting. That was the deal. I'm like, Michael, I'm not keeping an original oil painting of yours. And he goes, no, that was the deal. I'm not hearing anything of it. I'm like, all right. So... He said, what do you want the, the olive to do? And I'm like, why don't you make him like a window washer or like he's cleaning the sign? And he goes, all right, let me play around with it. So this became the final piece. It's backwards right now, I think, because the way you guys see it. But it's really, you know, it's really a big, big painting. Uh, and so if you see this particular one in his studios, they're all over in his studios because they make reprints of them. I have the original. And that's the Welcome to Las Vegas sign with the olive. And he's actually not cleaning. He's drinking a martini. So anyway, so then I still had to fix, you know, kind of what I wanted for like a Vegas thing. And I'm sorry, my house is a little messy right now, but um, this is what I ended up doing. I ended up doing, oh, see how you can tell I'm doing some recording, but I ended up doing a, a feature wall. And this particular wall uh, has all of my Vegas friends that have performed uh, on the strip and headlined. And um, for example, let me show you some of them. So I, uh, like, uh, this is Brooke. Brooke was in uh, Jubilee. Um, Brooke works in my show. This is when she was in Jubilee. And the Jersey Boys and Devin May and the Travis Clower and uh, Siegfried and Roy and Wayne Newton and Danny Gans and uh, Phantom. This is Andrew Ragon and uh, um, uh, Tom Jones and Louis Anderson and Elvis and Clint Holmes, a wonderful guy, good friend. Uh, Care Top, um, Veronique Dicaire, uh, this is Voki Kafayan, uh, Voki uh, was the gazillionaire, and anyway, you get the idea, and then I put my logo in there, um, and somebody came over one time and was like, oh yeah, you put yours, you know, for four squares, it's way bigger than everybody else, yeah, it's my fucking wall, I can do what I want, so yeah, I put it, so anyway, so, uh, and then, you know, Elvis is up there, and my buddy Gordy Brown, who does an impersonation of Elvis, is also up there right next to him, facing the same direction. I did that for Gordy. He really appreciated that. So anyway, that's, uh, that's my room. That's my mini little mini games room with the pinball machines. Um, thanks for indulging me on that. But what I'm putting here where the slot machines uh, were uh, is going to be awesome. I'm, I'm telling you right now, it's the coolest thing ever. I can't wait for you guys to see it. Okay, <sighs> let me get back to questions. Where were we? Thanks for asking. Uh, Joanne asking about the pinball machines. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, recommend five must-read books relating the mind sciences. 
Oh, I talked about a subliminal messaging book by Leonard Lodenow, I think is how you pronounce his name. Um, that's a great book. Uh, obviously, the Ormond McGill st Stage Hypnosis Encyclopedia is a great book. Um, excuse me. There's a Charles Tevitz book on self-hypnosis that's pretty good. Um, I would say Gil Boyne's Transforming Therapy book is good, but it's just transcripts. It's difficult if you don't understand. We're going to teach that in hypnotherapy, um, but it's a great addition to that. Um, yeah, there's a few anyways to get you started. Uh, all right. How do you go about uh, healing gastrointestinal reflux disease with hypnosis and assist in changing the way the mind creates uh, craves foods that cause reflux like tomatoes, onions, and citrus? All right. Great question, Jennifer. Well, the mind, you know, communicates an organ language. Organ language meaning that if you think something happened, you can cause the body to organically change. Uh, so hypnosis works really well with allergies, basically calming the allergic reaction to certain types of foods. So just the same, we would treat it just the same way. Um, but yeah, reach out to us uh, through my, my website, um, you know, or get to, um, get to Kate and she can do some sessions with that. I know, uh, you know, we can absolutely help you with that. Uh, Brent posted a link because a link, uh, we're talking about the training. Yeah, if you put F, FB Live on uh, as a discount, you get an extra um, discount off. So right now we have 40% off with the COVID-19. But if you put that FB Live, it takes it to 50% um, down. So that's a wicked deal for the course. Those of you who are taking the course, I hope you guys uh, are getting your money's worth and you're happy with it. Uh, all right. Okay, here we go. We'll keep looking. Uh, Diane, you're looking and feeling better. Yeah, I talked about, thank you for watching. I talked about it at the beginning. Uh, it was quite the ordeal, man. Um, but I'm definitely feeling much, much, much better. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn's asking if you had hypnosis for something like weight loss, uh, how do you feel afterwards regarding weight loss? If you have had hypnosis for something like weight loss, how do you feel afterwards regarding weight loss? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Meaning, do, do you... Maybe you can explain that. Uh, uh, um, you, how do you feel about weight loss? I mean, how you feel about yourself is what we're trying to drive um, and change your perception of yourself and trying to achieve the goals that you want to achieve for yourself. Because um, here's the thing, you know, weight loss, you, when you kind of approach it, you can say, hey, uh, you know, be confident with how much you weigh. Let's say you weigh 250 pounds. You can either accept that weight and not care what you want to do and change or... You can accept who you are as a person and also better yourself and become a better version of yourself. So both of those are right answers. Um, so how you view it also depends on what your goals are and what you want established. Um, because that ultimately, you know, and of course, when you hypnotize someone, you want to leave positive impressions into the subconscious mind so that they're good to themselves and that they love themselves and that they also have a desire to be better. Um, but we're not going to tell people, like hypnosis doesn't work as effectively when you program it in a negative way. Like you hate food and you hate donuts and you hate all of those things. Well, that's unrealistic. Um, and those suggestions will wear off uh, over time because they're not true. So that's, you want to create a healthy environment and a healthy approach to weight loss. I'm not sure if I really answered your question. So, um, okay, so... Um, is there another way to order shows from further back than what your shows since you switched over to the USB card? Greg is asking. Uh, we changed the entire system uh, back in June, I think, of 2016. That's as far back we can go. If we went back to the others, we have to re-pull all the whole system out. You know, we we can for, like, legal reasons or whatever, but it's just an absolute nightmare. So we haven't been doing it. Uh, that's that. Um, okay. Uh, Kate and Nicole, I want to get back into hypnosis, then do it. Um, all right. <laughs> Arlene, hope you're staying safe. I am. Thanks for asking. I hope you are as well. Um, William Sanchez asking, you should do a Disney trivia. Okay. All right. Um, It's one of the questions I ask in my showroom on one of the screens. In the cartoon Jungle Book, Ka is the snake that uses hypnosis to hypnotize Mowgli. But he is voiced by what famous voice actor from that era? Does anyone know that? And that famous voice actor also voiced a very, very popular 
children's cartoon character. So I'll let you guys play with that a little bit, and then I'll come back to it. Okay, um, can, we get help, can we get help from subconscious mind when it comes to learning new language? If, then how, if so, uh, then how? Uh, basically the same way that you would tap into studying and retaining information. So a lot of study programs, I hypnotize for memory recall, those types of things. A lot of times when we're accessing the conscious mind and we're thinking, just like when you're thinking of a name, okay? You're thinking of, oh God, what's that guy's name? What's that guy's name? What's that guy's name? Uh, I don't remember. And then you go back and you start talking. You're like, oh yeah, it's Dave. Same kind of thing because the subconscious mind can push forward those memories a lot more effectively than the conscious mind can. And the harder the conscious mind thinks about it, the less the subconscious mind responds. So the harder we try, the more difficult it becomes. So when learning a new language, dropping the anxiety level and letting things flow uh, tends to be uh, extremely, extremely helpful. Okay. Um, how do you deal with internet issues when doing uh, hypnosis, Zoom, and Skype? I know that uh, my partner, Kate, when she does this, she creates a secondary line. Okay, before we get started, what's your phone number? In case I lose you, I can call you, and we can continue over the phone. Um, that's usually the first thing. Uh, the second thing, people, just because you're hypnotized doesn't mean that you become stupid. If you lose connection, they start talking. People will come back out of hypnosis a little bit. And they'll make the phone call. They'll reconnect, and then get right back into it. No big deal. It really isn't a big deal. Um, but people think in their minds that it'd be, uh, you know, scary. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Anthony Torres is asking, what's your thoughts on self-hypnosis and what sources do you recommend? I've already recommended the Charles Tevitz book. Um, it's a decent book on hypnosis. It's a little older book, but it's a decent book on self-hypnosis. But nowadays, I mean, you can tap into any of that, uh, you know, content online it's a lot easier than it was years ago because it is easier to learn hypnosis and to be hypnotized when someone's guiding you along the journey than it is to find your own way so i recommend people doing it with some like programs some audio programs pop your headphones in you'll find some youtube videos or something and do some hypnosis that way get used to it get comfortable with it and then you can replay those words in your mind or you can guide yourself through hypnosis it's kind of a three-stage process i find works best uh, but again um you know there's lots of to start with you know following along with regular hypnosis. And then once you learn that pattern and you find a way that you can enter hypnosis easily, you can easily do it on your own. Okay. All right, let's go back to our trivia answer. William San Sanchez is just blowing the comments up with all this different kind of trivia and that's not gonna happen. So uh, we're gonna do one trivia and I did it. All right, so who again voiced the uh, snake Ka in Jungle Book. And the answer, I don't know if anybody put it up here because I'm not that far down, but the answer was Sterling Holloway. Sterling Holloway is the voice of Winnie the Pooh. He's got that little voice, you know, anyway. All right, okay. Uh, I'll keep on going here. I'm trying to get through some of these things. Okay, you guys have been awesome. You guys have so many questions, so many comments. They're not all questions. I'm trying to get through the comments, but I'm trying to stay in order. Um, have I ever visited Pakistan? I have not, but I, I would enjoy that. I would really enjoy going uh, overseas and, and checking out, you know, all of the Europe and Asia and the Middle East. I'd like to go all, all those places. I like to travel. I like to go meet new people from new environments and, and you know, new cultures. And I'd like that. All right. Um, okay. Okay, uh, Ed's asking, I hope you're well. I had a chat with Rory Z and Kate, who were my tutors, mentors, and they said, ask you regarding the button device that fits onto the mic and controls the music. Could I ask what it is called and where to purchase it? Easy. It is called Audio Ape. Audio Ape. And that controls music on your iPad, and you just tape the microphone right to your microphone, or tape the remote right to your microphone, and you can press the buttons. I have a video on my YouTube channel that describes that. Maybe Brent can throw it up here. Um, it's called, oh yeah, he's already done. He's already done that. It's Q-Labs. Uh, and then I use uh, the big brother of Audio Ape called Media Monkey. And Media Monkey controls a laptop, which controls lighting, sound, video, basically can do all of it. More expensive system. And right now the designer of it, Charles Pichock, has a discount where the units are 50% off right now during COVID because entertainers aren't working. And so he's giving people a good deal. All right, um, Busy's asking, was it the man that voiced Winnie the Pooh? Yes, yes, you, had it, you got it correct. And his name is Sterling Holloway, but it is the same, uh, same voice, Sterling Holloway. 
All right, um, just jumped on. So one of you asked back in 2011. I still laugh hysterically at my actions when I watched that video. I'm glad. Thank you for joining. Um, and then there, William Sanchez, the Sterling Holloway, which um, I just mentioned. Okay. All right, we're getting close to an hour. Um, thanks for jumping on board. I, you know, I may have missed some questions, and but uh, hopefully some of this was entertaining for you and it was educational. And uh, we'll see you guys uh, soon. Keep an eye out for when we're doing another one of these. And uh, till next time, uh, thanks to those of you who are in the class. Um, been a lot of fun getting to know all of you guys. And uh, stay safe out there. Stay smart. Um, who knows when Vegas is going to reopen? They're doing these phases. Um, <laughs> I don't really think that... Now, let me put it to you this way. Now, almost 65,000 deaths, which is awful and sorry to any of you who've lost a loved one or a close family member to to this and over a million cases and that's with us social distancing we have no vaccine testing is not efficient and there's not enough testing and the tracing capabilities are non-existent virtually and we're going to open the economy back up slowly, but nothing's changed. So now we had 65,000 deaths, over a million cases, and we're gonna, oh, that's with sequestering, and now we're gonna open the country. How is that going to work? Nothing's changed, and it's going to flare back up. Uh, so sorry if I'm being negative, Nancy, but seriously, I'm not sure what's going to happen, when hypnosis shows are going to be going again, uh, when all shows are going to be going again. Uh, it's not going to be the month of May. Probably not going to be the month of June. July, August, September? I don't know. Who knows? Um, stay safe out there. That's what's most important. Uh, your health is more important than your bank account. So keep that in mind. Uh, we'll see you guys on the next one. 